Good evening, I'm Maribel Tarouk. Police have arrested one man after a shooting in Greek town last night. It happened at a bar along the same stretch of the Danforth where a mass shooting took place six months ago. As Natalie Nanowski reports, residents in the area are concerned with how frequent shootings are becoming in their neighborhood. Richard Brown was closing down his bar last night when he heard a commotion across the street. I heard more big bangs, so I thought it was someone banging on my door. And I looked, saw kids run, so I just assumed maybe it was shootings after I saw cops show up. Officers arrived at Rivals Sports Pub to find a smashed window and drinks still on the table. Police believe two men got into an argument inside, one left and fired several shots into the bar. No one was injured, but in a community that's still healing from July's mass shooting that killed two people and injured 13 others, these violent acts are becoming far too frequent. It's nerving. It's scary. Yeah, I'm really upset about it, especially after, you know, there have been so many going on the past year. You know, there was the one back in August, even a couple months ago, one down by Donland, so it's really unfortunate. Yeah, it's hard to hear that when you wake up in the morning with a little guy and at 2.30 in the morning, yeah. <laughs> there was a shooting. In the summer, the community banded together, complete strangers supporting each other through the difficult aftermath of the Danforth shooting. Some in the area are beginning to accept shootings as a new reality. I think it's a safe neighborhood. I think that's, it's just uh, guns are everywhere and people use them everywhere. Today, the bar was open for business with a tarp covering the broken window, but the manager didn't want to talk about what happened last night. Police have arrested one man who they say is also wanted for a slew of other crimes, including attempted murder and domestic assault. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. A fourth day of deliberations has ended in the case of the man accused in the Toronto Eaton Centre shooting. Christopher Husbands is charged with murdering two men and seriously injuring five other people in the mall's food court six years ago. Today, the jury interrupted deliberations to ask questions about the circumstances under which Husbands could be found not criminally responsible. Kelda Yoon spent much of the day inside the courthouse and has more. The judge, Crown and defense convened in court this morning to examine the jury's questions. The accused, Christopher Husbands, was also present, dressed in a gray blazer and taking notes throughout. Now, his defense lawyers say that the jury needs to establish whether Husbands was aware he was holding a gun and was aware he was firing shots at people. But it was the jury's question surrounding criminal responsibility that was the most complicated and took the longest time to answer. Now, here's some background first. During the trial, the defense told the jury husbands should be found not criminally responsible for the murders because he was in a dissociative state as a result of severe PTSD. And they said it developed after he was brutally beaten and stabbed by a group of men three months earlier. And that when he saw some of these men at Eaton Center, it caused him to go into a dissociative state, making him unable to control his actions when he fired the shots that killed two people. The Crown, meanwhile, had argued that surveillance clearly showed husbands had acted deliberately Deliberately. Now, whether or not husbands was in a dissociative state is something even expert doctors could not agree on. But that's what the jury's biggest question focused on today. Here's defense lawyer Dirk Durstein. The jury's question in a nutshell was what if we find that some of the shots were fired in an intentional way and some of the shots were fired in a dissociative sense. What does that mean? And to echo the words of the jury, does that mean that the person was NCR, uh, not criminally responsible? And the, uh, the judge just said that fell down to the question of the onus um, that, uh, that the defense has to establish these things. Um, you know, it's not a question. I think it's fair enough to say that that's not a question that found its way very much into the trial process. Again, the defense is arguing the husband's was in a dissociative state throughout the entire incident. If the jury comes back and does decide that husband's was in a dissociative state when he fired some of those shots, but not all, it will then fall on the defense team to prove which shots caused the murders. And they say that's almost impossible to do. Meanwhile, deliberations continue this week. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. An update now in that story about the Brampton man arrested in his daughter's death. Peel police have revealed that Rupesh Rajkumar shot himself before being arrested. OPP arrested him Thursday night on Highway 11 near Aurelia. That's about 130 kilometers north of Brampton, where his daughter 
was found dead. They then transferred him into the custody of Peel Police. A spokesperson for those officers say they noticed he wasn't acting right. They called paramedics who transported him to a local hospital. Doctors there found he was suffering from a gunshot wound. A Peel Police spokesperson said the injury wasn't obvious. The province's police watchdog was notified of the injury, but decided an investigation into the officer's actions was not necessary. Raj Kumar will have a court appearance once his doctors say he is well enough. He stands accused of killing his 11-year-old daughter, Ria, who was spending time with him on her birthday. And Rhea's funeral service is scheduled for 9 a.m. on Wednesday at Lotus Funeral Center in Etobicoke. She was remembered by family, friends and community members at a candlelight vigil last night. Another vigil is planned for Tuesday night in Brampton. A homicide investigation is now underway in Ottawa after a man stabbed earlier this month died today. Police found the 44-year-old victim outside an apartment building in Lower Town on February 8th. He was taken to hospital and has now died. A 35-year-old man was arrested at the scene and was charged with aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, and possession of a dangerous weapon. Police say the two men knew each other. The search for a missing woman has ended after a body was found at a dump site this morning. Ottawa police believe that body belongs to Susan Kublu Iktatuk. Iktatuk was last seen by family on January 11th. The search to locate her involved almost 100 people and spanned 18 days. She and her 18-year-old daughter, Lenise Kublu, both went missing at the same time, but police later located the daughter in Toronto. She is now charged with second-degree murder and a dignity to a human body in relation to the case. A second person, 28-year-old Dwight Brown, who family says is Kublu's ex boy boyfriend is also facing the same charges. An autopsy is scheduled early this week to confirm the identity of the body. Well, it is dramatic and quirky and full of flair, but a Metrolinx ad also carries a hefty price tag. The provincial agency says it paid more than $177,000 to make this video to display it along with a GO bus at the Canadian International Auto Show cost another $55,000 and finally $65,000 for a marketing campaign. That is a total of almost $300,000 from the taxpayer-funded agency. Metrolinx says the point is to inspire customers to take a second look at GO buses and to rethink the benefits of a safe, comfortable and enjoyable ride. Well, it's time now to take our first look at the weather and Daksha Rangan joins us this evening. It's nice to see you, Daksha. It's nice to see you too, Maribel, and it's nice to be able to share with everyone what they can expect for their holiday Monday. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got any plans, but it is going to be chilly. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, we're used to that, I think, by now. <laughs> I think we are. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with temperatures that are below seasonal for this time of year. I mean, not by much. Seasonal for the city of Toronto, minus five would be your daytime high. Or rather, that's what we're seeing. But seasonal for this time of year, closer to the freezing marks, around minus two, minus one. A Sunday overnight, minus nine, feeling closer to minus 17. It's going to be chilly. And we are dealing with special weather statements. These are all issued by Environment Canada. You'll notice the city of Toronto included in this right around the Golden Horseshoe towards St. Catharines and this is because we are calling for snow. There is the potential for quite a bit as well depending on whereabouts you're located. It's this sneaky little system stateside. It's a Colorado low and it is staying further to the south so just along that northern edge we will actually be seeing the snow continue into the overnight hours into the pre-dawn hours on Monday as well so if you are hitting the roads you're going to want to be mindful of this and as for those expecting to see more snow well that's between St. Catharines toward Hamilton. All right, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks, see Dasha. See you in a bit. You're welcome. Global Affairs Canada says a group of about 30 missionaries from southern Alberta is expected home late tonight after flying out of Haiti yesterday. Others have already arrived. 
The largest group, 113 tourists from Quebec, arrived last night in Montreal. Back in Haiti, their tour operator, Air Transat, hired helicopters to airlift them from their resort to the airport in Port-au-Prince. And in Ottawa last night, Dr. Emilio Basile was greeted by family who had feared for his safety. He was on a medical mission with four other Canadian caregivers who risked their lives Friday driving to the airport, encountering roadblocks and demands for money. Every month, Haitians in the Toronto area meet for a church service. Today, they did more than pray. They also made plans. CBC's Talia Ricci saw how distance can make a difference. Let me try another one. Lost connections have been common these days. Has it been hard to get a hold of them? It's not possible. For many, the feeling of unease lingers with every dropped call. When I don't hear from them, I have that sense what's happening. This special mass in Creole brings the Haitian community together in Toronto. For some, what's unfolding in Haiti doesn't feel far from home. I feel like if I'm in the middle of it, but from afar, but I don't feel it's outside of my life. Antoine DeRose says he left the country just days before the violence began. I feel lucky that I'm back here with my family in Canada. At the same time, I'm feeling very sad of the situation that those are who are left behind have to go through. Many stayed after today's service to discuss ways they can help and to share their worries about family far away. People are not allowed to go about their personal lives. They had to stock up on food. The group plans to find out what supplies are most needed in Haiti, then raise the money to send them. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. There are calls today for charges to be laid against American actor Jesse Smollett in the wake of unconfirmed reports he orchestrated an attack on himself last month. We'll have the details coming up.
Acting U.S. Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan says the process to shift money to pay for Donald Trump's southern border wall will begin in earnest. On Friday, Trump declared a national emergency to allow him to divert billions of dollars from military and other programs. As we step our way through the process, we'll use good judgment. I think that's the, 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 the factor here. We have smart people and they'll use good judgment. Among the programs, Shanahan will look to tap money from our military narcotics enforcement and military construction. The Democrats have promised to fight Trump's national emergency declaration through the courts and in Congress. And Trump has taken to Twitter to urge European allies to take back hundreds of foreign fighters who joined ISIS. Donald Trump's demands come as the militant group makes its last stand in Syria and as American troops prepare to pull out of that country. Dominic Valaitis is watching developments for us in our London bureau. Yes, a couple of tweets on this from Donald Trump last night in which he called on European nations to take back hundreds of foreign fighters captured in Syria and put them on trial in their respective countries. Failing to do so, he warned, uh, could see them released. Uh, here's part of one of those tweets for you now. He says, uh, the US does not want to watch as these ISIS fighters permeate Europe, which is where they are expected to go. Not much of a response yet to these tweets from Donald Trump, but they come as ISIS finds itself on the verge of defeat in Syria. US backfighters there have pretty much cornered the group's remaining militants in Bakhouz, a village near the Iraqi border. They, and many of those already captured, are foreigners with a significant number coming from European countries. And what to do with them uh, represents a real challenge for some Western governments, which are reluctant to repatriate citizens who pledged allegiance to a group uh, sworn to their destruction. Uh, Britain is just one example. Last week, the Home Secretary here, Sajid Javid, warned uh, he would not hesitate to prevent the return of Britons who travel to Syria to join ISIS. But it's difficult to see how that would work, because under international law, it would be illegal to make an individual stateless, which is pretty much what the government would be doing by refusing to let them return. But certainly, Canada is another country facing this particular dilemma. We think about 30 Canadians are being held by US-backed forces in Syria. And critics say the Canadian government doesn't yet appear to have a plan for what to do with them. And with ISIS now on the verge of defeat, it is becoming a pressing issue. Dominic Velitis, CBC News, London. Police in Chicago say they want to talk to American actor Jesse Smollett again about an attack he says happened last month at the hands of Trump supporters. The incident has been held up as an ugly example of the widening divisions in America. But now, as Ellen Morrow reports, it's not clear if it was a hate crime or a hoax. I will never be the man that this did not happen to. Mm. I am forever changed. Ever since Jesse Smollett said he was the victim of a violent attack, the story has grabbed international attention. Kamala Harris, a 2020 contender, called it an attempted modern-day lynching. Smollett told police he was beaten and had a rope thrown around his neck by men who shouted a Make America Great Again slogan, along with racist and homophobic slurs. I think that's horrible. Uh, it doesn't get worse, as far as I'm concerned. But Smollett's story appears to be in doubt after two brothers seen in security video were arrested, then released. Police say the information they gave has shifted the course of the investigation. Innocence prevailed, all right? My guys are walking home. They're not charged. They are not suspects in this case. Turns out the men are brothers who knew Smollett, one as a personal trainer and as an extra on Empire, Smollett's TV show. U.S. news outlets are quoting unnamed sources saying police are now investigating whether Smollett paid the men to attack him. You do such a disservice when you lie about things like this. Smollett's team denies he orchestrated the attack, and in an interview Thursday, the actor expressed frustration at his story being questioned. Listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh, how can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. But there's growing skepticism and anger. We believe Jesse Smollett lied about being the victim of a hate crime and being assaulted. And for us, 
It's a slap in the face. Smollett says he feels victimized all over again by the latest doubts over his story. But if it was just a story and not the truth, he could face charges for lying to police. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. The sport of cricket has been growing in popularity in the GTA over the past few years and now a new cricket facility in the GTA will help connect more youth to the sport. I played cricket myself um, in England and in Pakistan as well when I came to Canada. There's not a lot of facilities like these um, and winter here is uh, long, longer as well than in England and Pakistan. So we definitely need uh, some facility that we can bring youth in, uh, get them off the screen and uh, bring them to sport. Nobody's seen a facility like this um, around in the GTA, uh, and it's a very central location, so people are very excited. Uh Fat Sportsplex opened its doors to the public today in Vaughan. Glenn McGrath with the Australian national cricket team was on hand for the inauguration. We had indoor facilities for basketball, volleyball, indoor cricket, things like that, and that had a big impact on me as a young cricketer coming through or a young sportsman coming through. So. You know, to have the opportunity to come here and, and open this facility is a, is a nice honour. The facility is located near Steeles Avenue West and Alness Street. 
a windy, snowy winter triathlon in Winnipeg is helping warm the city's homeless people. It was the first annual Beat the Cold race. CBC's Erin Broman was there. Take your marks! <laughs> More than 200 athletes take off on a frozen river. It's painfully cold, but no one seems to mind. 82% of these people are not triathletes. So it's really attracted quite the population of just people who are out here wanting to help a good cause. Thank you. The race was scheduled for last weekend, but had to be postponed because wind chill values were below minus 30. The racers fundraised $10,000 for a program called Just a Warm Sleep. It provides a warm bed in a city church to folks in need. So we've been at capacity most nights uh, this winter, whereas last year we got to capacity a handful of nights. It's minus 20 today in Winnipeg, but when you're in motion, you warm up pretty quickly. After a five kilometer bike, they'll finish with a skate. Carla McMillan waits for her turn to skate. Well, so far I've been standing here warming up by the fire, so it's been great. <laughs> she can't imagine being anywhere else. Well, one, to raise money and help a good cause and just to be outside. And we're Winnipeggers. This is what we do. We like to be outside. I'm going to make the cause dream. Organizers say the effort will go a long way. The money raised will fund the centre for 25 people through all of March. Don't judge a person by their homelessness because they might be a totally beautiful human with a totally beautiful story that'll break your heart. Way to go! After 15 kilometers, Marcus Fournier came in first. I'm feeling a bit tired. <laughs> that was a fun race. It's nice to come out to the Forks and have a great uh, triathlon here for the first time. It's awesome. Ty Bargan also crossed the finish line. I don't feel cold at all. How do you feel? I feel warm. Yeah, I beat the cold today and gave someone a warm bed. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Oh, yeah. I don't feel cold at all. That is the quote of the week, Dutcha. <laughs> I feel like that gentleman's <laughs> beard there a moment ago really puts into perspective that yes, it's cold, but it's not, not as cold as it could be. That's <laughs> right. Southern Ontario. You gotta be um, thankful we're not Winnipeg. <laughs> exactly. Good thing to keep in mind as you're clearing your driveways tomorrow morning, because we are going to be seeing some snow thanks to this system stateside. Not too much. We have seen our fair share this season, so nothing significant in the way of accumulations for some, but I should highlight that, that really depends on where you are around the Golden Horseshoe. So as we head to the farther western shores of Lake Ontario, you'll notice our northerly flow, it sort of goes to a more northeasterly flow, and that'll happen during the overnight hours, enhancing those snowfall totals for those between St. Catharines toward Niagara, but then also as we head further to the north, Hamilton, Burlington, you're sort of in that pocket of around 10 to 15 centimeters. So if you're planning on heading outdoors Monday morning, just bear in mind that you will be seeing that snow. It'll taper off during the mid-morning hours. And again, you'll notice as we head further to the north, out of the GTA two to five centimeters because this is along the northern edge of that system stateside Monday morning minus nine feeling closer to minus 17 so if you want to stay indoors I definitely don't blame you with those winds out of the north north cold air uh, infiltrating our forecast this is really going to be the story into the next seven days temperatures a few degrees below seasonal for the start of the work week, your daytime high Toronto, minus four. And then as we head into mid and late week, we are going to be keeping our eyes peeled to another system stateside that might impact our forecast and our commute. All right, well, we'll cozy up for family day. <laughs> Thanks, Dutcha. You're welcome. That's our show for you tonight. Thank you for watching. Have a great night, everyone.